Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. My name is Vicki and I'll be your presenter today. I've been working in the marketing industry for a number of years now and my favorite thing about working in marketing is the fact that I get to help small to mid-sized business owners maximize their success. So that is the spirit behind this webinar and all of the trainings that I do. Today's webinar is titled Must Know SEO Info. We're going to go over the secrets to maximizing your company website's Google search ranking. Why Google specifically and not one of the other search engines? Simply put, Google is number one. It's the one that people go to most often when they have a question and they look to the internet for an answer. So much so that Google has become part of our daily vernacular. Much like a facial tissue is called a Kleenex, searching for something on the internet is called Googling it. It's become a verb. Google has so much influence over our day-to-day -day lives that we may not even realize. We may carry Google in our pocket via our Android phones, or even if you have another mobile platform, you probably still use Google products. Some of us even use them in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. And with things like Google Home, we now have it literally in our houses. Google is kind of everywhere. What is SEO and why should I bother? SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. It is the multidiscipline process of optimizing a website to rank high in organic search results. Sounds a little technical, but we'll break it down. Multidiscipline simply means there are a number of factors that go into it. It's not a one-shot deal. Organic search results means not paid. If you think back to the last time that you searched for a product on Google, the first couple of results were probably sponsored or ads. They'll say sponsored or ad right next to them. Somebody paid for those to be at the top of that page. Organic search results are the results that nobody pays for. Those are the ones that we can influence by practicing good SEO. Now, what constitutes good SEO is often changing and always updating. Google updates their SEO algorithms, the way that they rate and rank your website and your content hundreds of times every year. It's impossible to keep track of every single little change, but practicing good SEO in general will result in better search rankings. The whole concept is relatively easy to understand, it's just a little more challenging to execute effectively. That's why we're going to show you some of what goes in the background of SEO and how to use those tools to influence your search results. All right, first up is on-page optimization. What that means is optimizing your entire website as a whole with the intent of helping it perform well in search rankings. Your page speed and your load times matter. Google will penalize a website in its rankings for having slower load times. The faster it loads, the better off you are. Keep that in mind when you're purchasing your web hosting because you want to make sure that, number one, your web hosting company has plenty of uptime. Of course, if your website is down, Google's not going to consider your website very reliable. You also want to make sure that you have plenty of bandwidth purchased. You may have a very reliable web provider, but if you run out of bandwidth, people aren't going to be able to load your page and Google will penalize your search rankings. Also, be aware that more people browse via mobile device these days than on desktop computers. Take this into account in every element of your site's design, from your home page to your landing pages to your media pages. Everything must be optimized for mobile. If your website looks great on desktop but is completely inaccessible on mobile, Google will penalize your search rankings. So make sure that that element is taken into consideration when you're designing your website. Also, make sure that you are using HTTPS even if you're not selling anything. You may think that just because you're not engaged in web commerce or there's no login information that your customers are providing that a secure site might not matter. However, just having a secure website immediately gives you a boost in Google search rankings. You also want to include social sharing links. Pick the social networks that are most relevant to your audience. For instance, if you are a managed services provider, you probably aren't doing a lot of posting to Instagram. Unless you're going around the office taking pictures of office supplies with fun Instagram filters, you're probably not going to find that that one's going to help you gain customers or gain their trust. So you want to go with what works for your business. For most businesses, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. The more professional you are, the more you want to lean towards LinkedIn. But those three are the big ones. Have those social sharing links on your page. They're usually little icons that have the uh, social network's logo. That way people can click on that and instantly be able to share your content. 
the more people can share your content, the more Google finds you relevant, the higher it will rank your uh, company in its search results. You can also use tools like WooRank and Yoast to test your overall website performance. A lot of websites these days operate on WordPress, and Yoast is a great plugin for WordPress to be able to monitor your on-page optimization. WooRank is another one that works across multiple platforms. There are others as well. Some are free, some are paid, but the gist of it is it will scrub your page much like Google would and see what your results are based on your current levels of optimization. If you have places that you need to improve, it'll let you know, and that way you can come up the ranks of the search rankings. Next up is keywords and how to use them. This is one of the biggest pieces of the SEO puzzle overall. Knowing your keywords and knowing where, when, and how to use them is how you will influence your SEO ranking the most. To start, you want to make a list of topics that are relevant to your business and your intended audience. Again, if you are a managed services provider, you may think that uh, terms such as computers, software, cloud, network, server are relevant keywords. And those are good head terms. They're very generic, they're very broad, but it does describe the industry in which you are providing services. However, the trick is to start to get specific. When you get specific, you end up with what are called long tail keywords. Think of it as the problem that you want your potential customers to bring to you that you can then resolve. So instead of simply saying cloud, you may want to think of the potential customer and what they may want out of cloud services. So if you want to have, say, legal firms as a potential client, think about how they would be looking for cloud services. They may search for legal documents stored in the cloud. Do your own search for those keywords. See what else comes up. Google will suggest alternate searches above and below the search box, depending on which keywords you use. Sometimes the presentation is a little bit different, but they'll always be there. Also observe the user intent. What that means is see what problems people are having and which ones you can attempt to solve. The more problems you can solve for your ideal clients, the better that you are going to be at being the authoritative answer for a wide variety of your intended clients' issues. You can also scope out the competition's keywords. There are tools that will do this for you. They're usually paid tools, so you do have to put some money down to be able to use them. However, you can kind of do it on your own by going to your com competition's website, looking at what they're putting out, look at their media, look at their main page, see what types of headlines they're using and what sorts of phrasing they're using. You can use those to do a little investigation of your own by putting those things into Google, doing the search and seeing where your competition ranks. If you think you can outdo them, go ahead and use those keywords as well. You want to make sure that you are using your keywords within the first 100 words of your page. When I say your page, I mean whatever page you're using, whether that's your main page, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a video, and yes, even if it's a video, you still want to have copy on that page and include your keywords. The first 100 words are what are ranked more heavily when Google does its scrub of information from your web page. So that's where you want to get those specific long tail keywords. You also want to use them throughout the rest of your page, but don't keyword stuff. When I said before that it's a bit of an art as much as it is a science and finding that balance, this is what I'm talking about. If you overdo the keywords, Google knows, and they will know that you are trying to game the results and they'll actually penalize your search ranking. So find the sweet spot, don't overdo it, and find different ways to phrase things as well. Up next is headers. H1 and H2 headers are elements on your page that are defined by some code that goes into the web page. If you don't know what those are or how to use them, that's okay. Talk with your web developer, or whoever works on your website, they'll point you in the right direction. However, loosely speaking, H1 and H2 headers are the article and page titles or section headers on your web page. You want to make sure that you are using these correctly. H1 headers are for articles or page titles, and they are tremendously important for SEO. This tells Google 
what your page is about. This is where you want to use those well-constructed long-tail keywords. Think of the question that your potential customer is asking, even if it's not phrased in the form of the question. This is the problem that you're going to solve. This is what people are going to search for. H2 headers are for your sections. You want to use long tail keywords here as well, but be creative with your phrasing. You don't want to repeat yourself over and over again verbatim. Then you get into the area of keyword stuffing, as I had mentioned before. Google starts to penalize you for that type of thing. So make sure that you're being a little bit creative when you're using keywords throughout the rest of your page. Next, you also want to make sure that your images are labeled correctly. You can include keywords in your image file names and your image alt text. If you have shorter keywords, those are gonna be the ones that go in the file names. Those can be your head terms, things that are a little bit more broad. The more specific long form ones you can put into the alt text. That information is also read by Google and can also influence your page ranking. If you wanna see whether or not you're on point with your on-page optimization, you can test it out for free at seo-browser.com. Now that we have the web page itself optimized, we wanna make sure that the content gets the same great treatment. First of all, remember that you're writing for your audience. Going back one more time, think of the questions that your target audience is asking. Let those keywords be your guide. If you phrase them as a question, it might be easier for you to determine what your authoritative answer is. You don't always have to do it as a question, but think of what people are going to be searching for. Think of the problems that they are looking for you to resolve. When you're giving that authoritative answer, go the distance whenever you can. Your word count does matter. You want to aim for at least a thousand words as often as possible. It's okay if you don't get there every single time. Especially on things like infographics or videos, you may not have a thousand words to say about those types of media. Don't sacrifice quality for word count. If you don't have the words to say, don't say them. That said, many industries will need more quality content to compete online. What this means is that if there's a lot of competition for a certain service, you're going to need to step up your game when it comes to content creation. You're going to need to think of those questions proactively. You're going to need to come up with answers that are creative and are better than what the people around you are putting out. It can be difficult, for sure, but you can always take it back to the earlier steps to reevaluate what questions your potential customers have and how you can be the best, most authoritative expert in answering them. Mix it up. Share more than just written articles. A lot of people get into the habit of just writing blog posts and spitting out a lot of blog posts, which can be great. Those blog posts stay around for a long time. If you have a really deep archive that does show that you are consistently putting out content, which can increase Google's confidence in your authority. However, there's way more out there than just blog posts. So don't neglect your other options. For instance, you can repurpose your best old content, a blog post that performed well, uh, an ebook that was downloaded a lot into a new format. You can take that ebook and write an article about it. You can take an article and create a video about it. You can take a video and do an infographic about it. Mix it up, keep it fresh. It doesn't matter if the information itself is tried and true. There's very little that's brand new out there on a day-to-day -day basis. That doesn't mean that you can't be creative and present it in a new light. Now that you have great content, make sure that you're writing great meta descriptions. Meta descriptions are the flavor text that shows beneath the link in a search result. If you look at the graphic that we have on screen, you can see a few examples. Everything that's highlighted in yellow is the meta description. The one at the very top is very warm and very conversational whereas the second one is just full of a bunch of keywords. So you can kind of see the difference and you can see what sort of influence a meta description might have. Google does state that the meta descriptions are not a ranking factor. There is some dispute on whether or not it actually does have an influence and whether or not it has an influence today has no bearing on whether or not it may be an influence in the future. Like I said, things change. However, the text that shows in the SERP, which is the search engine result page, can compel people to select your search result. If it gives you an edge, why not use it? 
It's right there. It looks nice. It's easy to do. All you have to do is write conversationally and aim to catch the viewer's attention. There's a 300 character max limit, so it's not a lot to write. You do want to make sure that you're using it on every single page of your website. People may use a search term that pops up on a blog article that isn't necessarily uh, one of your most popular pages. However, if you have a meta description on every single page, they'll get a good feel for what kind of content to expect on the rest of your website. You can try plugins like Yoast, which I mentioned earlier, if you're running WordPress, uh, for assistance with writing great meta descriptions. It'll actually rank the meta description for you and tell you uh, right there in the plugin whether or not it's going to be something that is a positive influence for your page. All right, moving on to links and how to use them. You may say, hey, I know what links are. We don't need to define those. Well, there's a couple of different kinds. There's internal linking and there's external linking. Internal links is links to other pages, articles, or media within your own site. If you are truly the authority in your area of expertise, one article that you write will probably reference some other information that you have elsewhere on your page. Try to get two to three internal links per page. One, it proves that you really do know what you're talking about and you've known what you're talking about for quite some time. Two, and more importantly, it gives reason to people to stay on your site. It's gonna get them to click through to other pages, they're gonna stay there longer. Click-throughs and time spent on page are very, very important for your search ranking. External linking is linking to authoritative quality pages outside your website that have relevant information. You want to be very, very selective about these links that you choose because the quality of the links reflect on the quality of your site. You don't necessarily want to link to a small blog because that may not be something that Google considers to be authoritative. Links to news articles or Wikipedia or other well-known web pages with a lot of influence are better to use because it shows Google that you're drawing your information from reputable sources. Makes you look like a reputable source in turn. Backlinks are the holy grail. And of course, they're the most difficult to obtain. So backlinks are when you link to an outside page and they link back to you. So external linking is just one way, whereas backlinks go in both directions. A lot of people try to get backlinks to very popular web pages, and it's difficult because the authors and the people who write for those big pages probably don't necessarily have time to review your content and see if you're worth them putting their seal of approval on. So how do you get those backlinks? Couple of options. First is writing case studies on the products that you use, especially if you've had spectacular results and you can share with your vendors and your partners. If you use a certain piece of software and you found a great way to use it that maybe others haven't thought of, or if you've had exceptional results doing something, write up that case study and then contact the people putting out the product on which you wrote the case study. That's great business for them because now someone is giving a fantastic review, they might be more likely then to allow you to have a link to your site on their site if they publish the case study for you. It's a little bit, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. In the same vein, write reviews for the companies and products with which you work. Go to Google, go to Yelp, go to social media, uh, do other searches for other types of review websites. There's more than just those out there. If you take the time to write those reviews, your name goes on it, make sure your company name is somewhere in the information as well, and suddenly you have a backlink. Those types of things require you to maybe put a little bit of pressure on the other person. It depends on, on them being responsive to what you're giving them. Another good way to do this is to build genuine relationships both online and off. Whether this is with customers, clients, whether this is with vendors with whom you are the customer or the client, or if it's with someone in your immediate community. This can also include the media. If you become someone that they know and they can trust, they're going to be more likely to put your name on something when they need to give information on a topic they know that you're the expert on. You can also volunteer to speak at groups in your area. 
whether it's chamber of commerce or if it's educational groups or even hobby groups that you might be interested in. Volunteer to give talks at those groups, whether it's on something that is directly involved with your business or something that's only tangentially involved. Getting your name and your face out there, building genuine relationships with people will build that trust so that they will be more inclined to give recommendations to you and to put that information on the internet where they can backlink. Now we're starting to talk about how to gain an edge. What can you do that's going to put you over the top? First up, reviews, reviews, reviews. Positive user reviews influence SEO ranking. Some people will claim that it doesn't. The evidence says otherwise. Google Business and Yelp reviews are the most popular and the most widely used. But as I alluded before, they're not the only ones out there. Do a search for your business type and your location to see if anybody's using any other review sites. There are some that are geared more towards homeowners. There are things like Angie's List. You never quite know what other websites in the area that people might be using. There's also a new web, well, newer website um, that people have started to use. It is called Nextdoor. It started as just a social network for neighbors in different neighborhoods uh, to have a closed social network that you could only be invited into, but it's opened up to communities and it also does have reviews of local services. So make sure that you are checking to see what people in your area are using. It's okay to ask happy customers to leave a positive review, and in fact, we encourage you to do it. Whether you give them some sort of incentive or just say, hey, if you liked what we did, if you liked our service, if you liked our product, can you give us a review? A lot of times if people had a really good experience, they want to tell other people about it. Sometimes they just need a reminder to go do it. Sometimes they just need to know, you know where you prefer to have a review left. Go ahead and make that outreach. Just don't nag people about it. Again, it's all about balance. It's okay to ask. Next, location, 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 and other ways to be relevant. Don't forget to include your location in your keywords, especially if you are providing services mostly to local clients. Make sure that you're including your city, your surrounding area. If you live somewhere that has you know, a greater such and such region, include that in your keywords from time to time. This will signify to Google where you are located, and even if someone doesn't necessarily search for the name of the city, if Google knows that that person is in the city and they're searching for a specific service, they're going to put local results towards the top. So don't be afraid to tell Google exactly where you're located. You can also consider other ways to signify that your information is relevant and current. You can include the year in your title when relevant. So let's say that you're talking about the top 10 best products of 2018. Put that right in those uh, keyword titles. People will know, hey, this is something that was published recently. And then keep doing that. The more people realize that you are posting content that is relevant now, the more Google will see you as a current authority as opposed to someone who knew what was going on five years ago. You also want to be the expert in one area. Talked a lot about these long, uh, long tail keywords, how to find them. When you're doing your research, on those keywords. When you're going to Google and you're doing the search yourself, seeing how many results come up, if you find one that gets a lot of search action, meaning a lot of people are searching for it, but there's not a lot of competition, go deep on that keyword. Be the authority on it. Come up with one article or landing page or media page, whatever, and write in depth on it, and then use your internal links to your advantage. Since that keyword is going to get a lot of search and there's not a lot of competition, you'll rise to the top very quickly. Then when that article has links to other pages in your website, those pages will start to rise in rank as well. So find an area to be an expert in. It's not easy to do and you may have to get creative and you may be surprised what area you might be the expert in. Got a tool that we'll talk about in a minute that will Give you a little bit of insight on that. Optimize for mobile. No, really. <laughs> I'm repeating it because it is worth repeating. The percentage of non-desktop searching is only going to go up. Everybody has smartphones these days, just about everybody. And a lot of us keep our smartphones 
close at hand way more than we probably should. I am guilty of that. I am not judging anyone. That said, even though I have a great desktop computer, I have a great laptop computer, I find myself doing a lot on my phone, even when I'm at home. And then when I'm not at home, of course, I have my mobile device. That's often when I'm looking for local services. So any web page that I try to visit that has mobile website that I can't navigate on, forget it. They're not getting my business. So want to make sure that you are reaching people where they are and that's on their phones. All right, going to talk about voice search. Everything that we've talked about up to this point are tricks that are tried and true to benefit you today. This is going to be the number one tip that's going to benefit you in the future. More and more, we are inviting these AI assistants into our homes, whether it's Google's product or if it's Amazon's Alexa. We have these devices now in our homes, uh, and even activated on our phones, where we can talk to them, ask them questions, and they're going to give us results. The results that they get if we're asking them for local services is going to be Google search results. So the number one thing that's going to set you apart in the future is a, the ability to have your web properties appear in voice searches. What you need to do is think of the questions that people are going to ask via voice search and then answer them. So for instance, if I am looking for dry cleaners in my area and I ask that of my Amazon Alexa, it's going to give me the first results, the most relevant result. If you can manage to be the most relevant result, people aren't gonna go on to the next answer. They go, okay, that's the top result, that's where Alexa is sending me, I'm good to go. So the biggest factor in this is going back to location, location, location. Make sure that when you are talking about services and elements of your business that are relevant to local people, businesses, whatever, that you are including your location in your keywords. All right, I had mentioned a minute ago about a great tool to use that's going to give you some insight into those highly uh, specialized keywords. The answer to that is Google Search Console. Yep, we're going to use a Google product to learn more about a Google product. Google Search Console provides great insight into how your site is performing in Google Search. It is a free tool. You do have to go through some steps to enable access to it, but overall it's fairly user-friendly. There are a lot of features within Google Search Console, but the biggest one that is going to help you in this context is the ability to see which keyword searches on Google led to your site being listed in the SERP. Again, the SERP is the search engine result page. And you also can see the click-through rate of those listings. This is going to tell you what people are searching for when your result is coming up in that search and how often they're clicking on your link as opposed to someone else's. This information is worth its weight in gold. This is where you are going to want to keep an eye on those search terms, see how people are getting to you, see where you would think that people would be finding your website and they're not. Find those gaps, find those places of influence and use them to your advantage. There are a couple other tools as well. There is SpyFu, which is a program that lets you spy on your competitors, see what keywords they're using, and how well their site performs. I alluded to this earlier as well. Um, I did say that you can kind of do this manually by you know, just observing their websites and, and seeing what keywords they're using in their, their headers and whatnot. Uh, but this tool will do it for you. It does cost a little bit of money. You are going to have to pay them for their service. But if you are really looking for that competitive edge, it's available for you. There's also SEMrush, S-E-M-Rush, uh, also provides some valuable insight into the world search. It will give you uh, your competitor's best keywords. It will help you find competitors you didn't even know you had. It will start to show you even what kind of money that your competitors are spending on their advertising or on their, uh, you know, their search engine advertising, if your competitors are doing that. You can see lots of information, not just from your competitors, but also from top publishers and advertisers. You can also evaluate some of the links that you use. Basically, this is a product that if you 
are watching this webinar and you're like, I am all in on SEO, this is a tool that you are going to want to purchase for yourself and your business. It is a great resource and it's one of the best out there, definitely recommended. You can also utilize other great resources, excuse me, that are out there that are not necessarily tools that will analyze your website. Uh, Neil Patel is a fellow who has a website that gives daily information on SEO and general search topics and a bunch of other marketing type topics. You can see we've got his lovely picture there in the corner. He's very pleasant to listen to. He presents things in a very digestible way. Uh, he's great for those who really want to get more in depth on a specific topic. There's also moz.com. Uh, it has lots of information on businesses wanting to get more from their SEO, wealth of articles uh, where, that you can read through and find out more in-depth information on any specific topics that have interested you. And there's also Search Engine Journal, which is another great site with free SEO resources, lots of articles to read and ways to get some more information. Moving on to advanced SEO. So this is going to be some of the what's new, what's really behind the scenes. This is going to be the, the good stuff that uh, some of you may be here, may have been waiting this whole time for. So first off, schema.org. Schema.org is the website that documents uh, the work that a number of different entities have done in defining a language, uh, the schema, for the code that goes into websites. Now, if code that goes into websites sounds way too complicated for you, it's not that bad. A lot of it are maybe in, uh, pieces of information that you've already seen before. What they're doing is going through and defining the best use terms. If you're familiar at all with HTML, there was, back in the old days, a number of different ways that you could go about doing any specific task, whether that's displaying an image or loading a web page, there were different ways of doing it. The problem with there being different ways of doing it is that there were also different browsers that had different ways of displaying things. So a website that looked great in Internet Explorer might have been completely non-functional in Netscape. So as the internet has grown up, a lot of these larger entities have banded together to write a definitive list of codes that websites can use that are best practices. Some of those older code items still work, but they're outdated. And if you are, for lack of a better term, caught using them, Google will see that and say, that's not the most up-to-date practice. That's going to hurt your ranking. Google's algorithms are only starting to scratch the surface of what is possible as far as what information they're looking for and how it influences their rankings. That said, some of the neat things that you see on different types of websites are elements that have been defined by schema.org. For instance, if you look at the graphic example that we have, you can see there are uh, star ratings for that particular or those particular restaurants. That's an element that was taken from schema.org that has been identified as something that is preferable in the eyes of, of Google search. So if you have those bits of code to show those reviews, Google sees that and gives your ranking a boost. There are also other ways of implementing it. You can see in the graphic that Last.fm has some bonus information on some of those tracks that's listed on that album. There are a number of different ways to do it. There's reviews, there's ratings, there's additional product descriptions. You can do things like schedules for your business. All of these additional elements that are well-coded that fall within the schema.org recommended parameters are seen by Google as indicators that your website is modern and follows the rules that the web community at large has agreed upon, and it views all of that favorably. This is something that, since it is so in-depth and it is going to involve some coding on your website, you're going to want to talk to your website developer, or if you've outsourced SEO, you're going to want to talk to that company to ensure that schema.org elements are part of your website. Word of caution, you want to make sure that if you've already implemented some of this, that the code is compliant with the schema.org parameters. 
if you start using things incorrectly, Google will negatively impact your score. Another cool option is rich snippets. Rich snippets are search results that include ratings, reviews, images, video content, and more. They stand out from the other search results because the search engine has more data about the site, so it can pull some of those images, ratings and reviews, and put it right underneath the search result like you see in the graphic on the screen there. It is something that can be used in conjunction with some of the other elements, or it can be well used on its own. This is something that you would want to set up using the structured data found in the Google Search Console. When you find that a certain search term is bringing people to a specific blog article or media element, rich snippets may be something where you want to have that code included on those pages so that the search result is even more greatly enhanced. People also ask. People also ask is more of a feature that you should pay attention to than a tool that you can enable. It is something that only pops up with the most popular search terms. If Google gets the same question over and over and over again, it's going to put that information right up front for people to review. They can get their answer quickly. They don't necessarily have to click through to another page. Because the searchers get immediate answers, they may never actually click through to your website. So it's not necessarily something that's going to get immediate return on value. What this does though, is it reinforces the need to ensure that your website and your content solves people's problems, answers their questions, and offers expert advice. The more expert advice that your website offers, the more that Google is going to identify that that expert advice is there from you. And if you are doing your SEO correctly, you just may pop up in the people also ask answers for frequently asked questions. It's a great benchmark to see whether or not your SEO strategy is working. It can also give you an example of a way to improve on your SEO, especially if you ask a generic question about your field of expertise and you see a competitor's answer or you see an answer that you know, is just from maybe a major media outlet or, or other source, that's an opportunity for you to go deep on that topic. The more you can speak authoritatively on those types of issues, the more you are going to benefit from the uh, people also ask feature. The big catch here, earlier in the presentation, I have mentioned that you don't necessarily have to phrase things in the form of a question when you're writing articles or blog posts or so on and so forth. To show up in people also ask, you do have to specifically be answering a question. So this is where asking those questions, identifying questions that your potential clients are going to ask, and then going deep on them benefits you in SEO terms. And let's talk about social media. Social media is a hot topic. Lots of people use it, and a lot of businesses don't necessarily think that there's any value in it. However, I am here to tell you that social media does play a role in SEO, and social content will affect your ranking. When someone shares an article from your website onto social media, this creates what is called a social indicator. There is information in that link that tells Google where the poster originally found that information. It can also tell Google how many times that information has then been reshared. So these social indicators can build and grow, and the more things are getting shared, the more relevant Google will consider your content. This is why reviews from social sites do matter. If someone searches for your business name, there is a good possibility that if you have a Facebook page, that your Facebook profile could come up. Or if you have a LinkedIn company page, that may show in the search results. If those reviews are positive, that's good news for your company. That's why it's good to seek out those positive reviews on a number of different avenues. Consider also that social media channels are their own search engines. You can go into Facebook, do a search for a local business, and get a result. That's a search engine. You may not think of, of Facebook and Twitter and even things like YouTube as search engines, but it may not be the same type of search as you would do on Google, but you are still finding out information on a company. 
Uh, Neil Patel has a great article called Social is the New SEO, where he goes really into depth on this topic and how to use it to your advantage. Um, definitely excellent extended reading. Highly recommend it, even if you don't check out anything else. That is one that I feel like a lot of businesses are overlooking right now. There's been some negative impact in recent Facebook changes on how successful social media marketing is for small businesses. This type of thing shows you why it's still relevant and why it's still worth your time and why neglecting social media can still cause a negative effect for your company, which of course we don't want. And we're just about there. So in conclusion, Here's the most important things to take away from our discussion today. First of all, the days of a long list of your services are over. You don't need to have every single thing that your company does listed on your web page. What you have today is an optimized web page with content that's optimized for today's audience. Keywords are used intelligently and accurately so that you are answering the questions that your customers are asking. You are solving the challenges that your potential clients have. And because you are going offline and interacting with people in your community, as well as reaching out online to both individuals and businesses and the media, you now become a valuable resource to those people. You become the expert in your field in their eyes. If you have gone through all of this and you feel like it is more than you can handle, or you are still lost and you just don't have time, feel free to find a great web marketer. We are out there. We want to help you. This is something that does require a bit of finesse to do successfully. If this excites you and you want to run with it, fantastic. We are here to support you as well. But don't feel bad if it is something that you decide that you want to outsource because as you've seen here, Man, we can go on for quite some time talking about how SEO can impact your business. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you do have any questions, please send an email to questions at seowebinar.net. We are more than happy to answer any outstanding questions that you have and give you the information that you need to succeed at SEO 